have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Psalm chapter 10 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. I'd encourage you to grab that Bible. In fact, if you don't have one, you can take that Bible home with you, that Bible in the pew in front of you. And in that Bible, you'll find our portion of Scripture on page 692, 692 in the Bible in the pew, and then we'll open to Psalm chapter 10. What do you preach on on Patriotic Sunday? That's a question that I have to ask myself. Well, what, what do you preach on? Do you preach on America? Do you preach on the Bible? Preach on God? And there's a portion of Scripture that I think will, will help us today. Miss Hayes, Chelsea Hayes, sang that song, Heal This Land. It is not lost on me, as I'm sure it's not lost on you, that we look out in the land of America, and though we love it, she's broken. She broke. You, you watch the political landscape, and if you've been here at church at all, you know that I often will steer clear of the, the politics because, to be honest, we come to church, we come to hear about God, not about politics. All right? But, but we are coming up to election, in case you don't know that, and, uh, and you'd have to be kind of disconnected not to realize that. And as we come to election, just so you know where I stand on this, uh, why well, must vote by my faith? My faith is not merely for church. All right? My faith is for my life. All right, and every day I want to live in the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It affects how, it affects how I spend my money. It, it affects the decisions I make, and it definitely must affect how I vote. I must vote according to the principles from the word of God. All right, and that's where I want to find who lines up with those principles, a bit closer. But, but I, don't, I steer clear of those politics because it's just, it, it's weighty. It, it's, it's, it's messy. It's just not, it's not good. But minus the politics, America still isn't, it's not in very good shape. We don't look around and say, man, you know what? What a, what a wholesome nation we're in. Wow, I can turn on my TV and I just find wholesome programming. I look on Facebook and I find wholesome news articles. We don't, we don't think that. We don't look at society and say, wow, you know what? After 25 years, people live more morals, have more morals than they did 25 years ago. We don't think that. In fact, we, we think, my goodness, what is this world coming to? Some of you who are elderly, who are older saints, you think, boy, when I was a child, fill in the blank. You'll go on to tell me, well, I don't, I'm glad I don't have to raise my kids in this day and age, but, but that's what we're called to. We're called to live here. We didn't choose when to be born, did we? We didn't choose what era or what location, but, but we are blessed. We are blessed this morning. I am blessed, and you are blessed. If you can hear the sound of my voice, you are blessed. If you can't hear it, you are still blessed. This morning, I want to preach. I've titled the message, I Love This Land. It's a very simple, simple thought this morning. I want to first of all talk about America's prosperity, then America's demise, and then America's answer. That's where we're going today. We're going to look at Psalm 10 in just a moment. But I ask him for the Lord's help and blessing as we, as we look at this concept, I love this land, and then ask for his help on what the answer is. Lord, we sure love you today. And I ask for your help as I speak that everything that I do would please you and honor you. Lord, I pray that during these next few moments, we're going to look at your word in a moment. And Lord, I pray that you would guide our hearts, our minds, and our thoughts. And Lord, may we walk away this morning not discouraged, but encouraged. Lord, may we walk away closer to you, to your word, and to your way. Lord, I ask that you would bless this time. And if there's someone who is here or online who will gather this message at a later date who does not know you as Savior, who does not know Jesus Christ and the death and burial and resurrection of him on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, Lord, I pray that today the gospel would be clear above all else. And that no one would leave this time or leave this message at any point that they hear it, not understanding what Jesus did for us and not being willing to accept it. Lord, I ask for your help. I need you this morning, but we need you in the service in Jesus' name. Amen. What do we do when our country changes? What do we do when we look around and see things that, in our country, our nation, that, that maybe we just don't like? There have been a variety of answers to that question. Some have said, that's it, I'm leaving America. And going where? And going where? I could list off the countries that people say they're fleeing America to, but then it would become a, it would take us off, off point. Would it not? 
But, but, but what are you going to do? To others, they began then to rally. And, and I'm talking about pastors for a moment. All of a sudden, the pulpit becomes a, a political platform week in, week out. What are we to do? Others cry. Every time you talk to them, all you hear is how bad this nation is. Have you ever met someone like this? Please, raise your hand if you have. I have everything comes back to the state of America. I'm like, I just don't live my life that way. Others, they hide. That's it, I'm buying, I'm buying a plot of land in the middle of nowhere, and I'm going off the grid. If that's what you want to do, fine. I have no problem with that. Um, when you run out of supplies, call me. I'll pick you stuff up from Walmart. But, <laughs> well, you probably can't call me, so let's get a string and a, and a, and a couple cans. Others prepare. This morning, I want to talk about, first of all, America's prosperity. We live in a wonderful place, but it's not a perfect place. We are ranked, they say, seventh in personal wealth globally. And there are six other nations who, per capita, have a slightly more wealth than we have. Boy, you didn't know how poor you were this morning, did you? You didn't realize how rough you had it. You look at the typical American, house, job, vehicle, stability, freedom. Most of us, if not everyone in this room, looked in our closet this morning at not one and not two outfits, but a plethora of outfits that don't fit any longer, that are too old we've had for too long, and then we move to the clothes that we do have, and then we move to the clothes that we actually wanted to wear today, and then we work through the ones that weren't clean for today, finally settling on something red, white, and blue to wear to church today. We're blessed. We're blessed. Most walked out of a house that had more than one bathroom. More than one bathroom of running water, indoor plumbing. That alone is a blessing. Past a refrigerator that keeps food cool, past an oven that makes food hot. And when we're just too lazy, past a microwave that makes your food hot while giving you cancer at the same time. Carrying a cell phone with unfettered internet access 24 7. We're not bound like some nations where they filter everything for you. America is a prosperous nation. We are number one in global economy. In freedom, in freedom, we are the number one leader of the free world. I found an interesting statistic. They actually said we only rank number seven on world freedom. But here are the comments based on this study. They use this illustration. They said it's like a Texas, a Texas bullseye. Their story, not mine. An old farmer was shooting Texas. He took his rifle and he shot inside of his barn. And around that, around that place where he hit the barn, he painted a bullseye target. He said, look at that, I hit right there in the bullseye. They say when you look around at the world, when they base it upon freedoms, that truly America is the freest country. We can go today anywhere you want to for lunch, and you have so many choices, yet it feels like you have no choices, does it not? It's like looking in the fridge, teenagers, there's nothing to eat in the house. Nith. We have freedom. We're a republic. Going back to the Texas target, but again, they say so is North Korea and Russia. We have freedom of speech, of choice. Just go try to buy a box of Cheez Its at Walmart. You have freedom of choice. Do you want real Cheez Its or fake Cheez Its? Do you want yellow Cheez-Its or white Cheez-Its? Big Cheez-Its or little Cheez-Its? And that's just on the Cheez-It aisle. Of travel, north, south, east, west. Where could you not go? Are there curfews? No, you could travel at night. You can leave at 1 in the morning, at 2 in the morning, 1.35. It doesn't matter. You can drive to Michigan, you can drive to California, you can drive through Texas and to Florida. We have financial prosperity, we have freedom in our prosperity, and we have spiritual prosperity. Can you believe we get to gather together as a church? As a church. 
In China, they can't gather like this. Not without fear of being locked up or at the very least disbanded. There is no fear of hiding from this. In fact, we live stream it. We tell people what we're meeting as church. We advertise it. We invite people. We announce it. We market it. We say, hey, come to church. Where are you meeting? On King Road. The freedom that we have. We put it on TV. Everyone can know we have church. What a blessing. You come to church and there's no one walking to the parking lot writing down the license plate numbers. You leave church and you can come back tonight to church, as you should, amen? Fair enough, I'll give a mediocre 50%. Freedom of religion. And in our country, not only can you worship God, but you can worship really any way you want to. Now, this is the true way, but I'm grateful for that every religion has a freedom. I'm grateful for that. There's a prosperity there. But I mentioned that when we look at America's demise... Because with all the financial freedom and the financial prosperity, with all the freedom that we have, with all the spiritual uh, history and historical tradition that we have, America is not better spiritually, morally, than it was 100 years ago. There is no one that would look at America 100 years ago and say, wow, America is stronger in Christian faith. America is stronger in its morals than it was 100 years ago. In fact, the morality of America is on a very fast decline. Marriage is corrupted. Marriages are corrupted. Individuals are corrupted. And and it seems as if the statement of judges has come true, that every man, every woman, every child does that which is right in their own eyes. But when, when and how did America begin a demise? So we're going to look at Psalm 10 in just a moment, seeing your Bible's ready. Because some would have us believe that, uh, that America's demise was when we voted him out of the public school. And maybe you've heard that before. We voted, we kicked him out of the public school, and that, at that point, that's when America began, began to, to track a downward. My friends, I submit this morning, it was not. It was not when he was voted out of the public school. Others will say, well, when the Ten Commandments were removed removed from the courthouse, when that happened, then America has kicked God out. My friends, that is merely a symptom of a great problem. Still still others would say, well, when under God is being skipped in our Pledge of Allegiance, then, then we're on demise. My friends, merely symptoms of a great problem. I'd like us to look in Psalm chapter 10 because Psalm chapter 10 gives us some insight to humanity. In Psalm 10, the writer is perplexed. The writer is discouraged. The writer feels alone and forsaken as if God has removed himself from the equation. And I'm drawing the correlation this morning that at times, if we look at our great country, we can feel the same way. God, it feels as if you've removed yourself from the equation. Verse number one, the Bible says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of what? Of trouble. This psalm will begin to then walk down the path But there's an interesting verse we find in verse number four, where the Bible says, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the Lord. America's demise was not found in the removal of God from the public school. America's demise was not found when the Ten Commandments were removed from the courthouse. America's demise was not discovered 
when Roe v. Wade was enacted, which is why America wasn't saved when Roe v. Wade was removed. America's demise begins, first of all, verse 4 tells us, with a departure from God, where the Bible says the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. My friends, the problem with America, the reason there's a demise, is because there are those who do not have God in their thoughts, who do not have God in their life. I'm going to jump ahead to the end, but the answer is not another political party. The answer is not other laws. The answer is not removing bad laws. The answer is Jesus. And America's demise has begun, is there, because there's a departure from God, We see it in the schoolhouse. We see it in the public square. And we see it socially and economically. But the the fact is, it's individually that we have departed from God, that God is not in any of his thoughts. Someone said, prominent man said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers and power and wealth as no other nation has grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. We have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace and too proud to pray to the God that made us. The man who said that was Abraham Lincoln in 1863. And those words ring just as loudly and just as true. You know, people find time to pray when trouble hits, don't they? After the Twin Towers were hit... I was in New York City four or five months later. The wreckage was still there, but there were now candles which were still burning brightly. It was eerily quiet. I'd been to the city many times before. In the city, if you've been to New York City, it's a hustle and bustle of life and activity, sometimes called the, the city that never sleeps. You can find a, a diner open, a coffee shop open. You can find a little, a little bistro open at all hours of the night. During the day, the, the sound of taxi cabs and just the honking of horns is just prevalent. It's loud, and, and those millions of people just moving everywhere. And, and, but, but I got to that point there in the city with the Twin Towers and the financial district, and it was like a capsule of just quietness. And people who had never acknowledged God in all of their life were now praying to a God they didn't know. You see, America's demise begins because we've just departed from God. The verses go on to say this, not only is there there's a, a departure from God, but a, de- a denial of reality. Look in verse number six where the Bible says, he hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. When someone departs from God, they can't even view life correctly, a denial of reality. This person who has departed from God is saying, I'll never have any trouble in life. Well, how untrue is that? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that that trouble comes. Flat tires and blown engines are the least of our troubles. Broken sump pumps and wet basements and collapsing walls and health issues and child issues, relational issues, job issues, pandemics, they're problems all around us. Yet someone who is deceived in their heart denies reality. Oh, there's no problems. This is great. Not only is there a denial of of reality, but a deceitfulness in life. Verses 7 and 8, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. All of their life, there's deceitfulness in there. There's terrible choices of life when someone has departed from God. We wonder why abortion is so rampant. The, The murder of the innocent because there's a departure from God, not because the law was there is not there. You see, when we depart from God, everything else will be a tragedy. All of life will be tumultuous, will be trouble. So what's the answer? What's the answer? Will God save America? 
Will God spare America? Let's look at the scripture and see what God says. See what the writer says. Remember, he started the psalm discouraged, disappointed, seemingly forsaken. Verse number 14, we find a glimmer of light. Thou hast seen it. The writer says, God, you've seen this. You know what's going on. You know what's happening. Thou hast seen it. For thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it, require it with thy hand. The poor committed himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. Number one, remember this. Here's the answer. That God's character... God's character brings help. I love how that verse starts, thou hast seen it. God is still God. It may get worse in America, but God is still God. They may vote God out of more places, but God is still God, and he sees it. He's not caught off guard. He's not surprised. He's not aghast. He knows, he sees, he understands, and his character, God's character, brings help. God hasn't changed a lick. God is the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, and in case you wonder how long, forever. He was the same before America was founded, and he'll be the same if he tarries and America is no more. God is the same. God is the same before the foundation of the world, and he's, he is the same after this world will be burned up. God is the same, and his character of goodness and hope and help brings help to us. Why can you live a good life in a bad nation? Because God has good character. Why can you live a good life when life brings trouble and turmoil? Because God is good. How can you have joy in life even when the election doesn't go your way? Because God is God. I'm not dependent on what happens. I'm dependent on him. And he doesn't change. He doesn't change his character. It brings help. There was a man who wrote a book. And in his office, he had an unusual picture. He had a picture of a fence post and a turtle on top of it. And we have turtles in our pond, mostly small little things and one big little thing. Someone walked into his office one day, this writer, and said, Alex, why do you have a turtle on a fence post on your wall? Natural question, unnatural answer. He said, it's to remind me that that turtle could not have got up on the fence post without some help. And my friends, we would be good to remember that we're just a turtle in this world, that what we do needs help. To be on any fence post in life, we need the hand of God. And God's character brings help. Not only does his character bring help, look at verse number 16. The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. God's power brings hope. His character brings help, his power. You know how strong God is? Yes. You can't measure God in horsepower because he created horsepower. You can't measure God in kilowatts. Because he created energy, electricity. You can't measure God in fission or fusion because he made matter. How big is God? How strong is God? Yes. Yes, he is. He's still on the throne. He's still supreme. He still has authority. Nothing else is greater. Nothing else is over, is, can overcome God. God is still in charge. When the world looks bad, he's in charge. When everything looks bleak, he's still present. And when life seems tough, he's still in control. God's power brings hope. You've been at home. It's raining outside. Thunder, lightning. All of a sudden, the lights flicker. Ah. <sighs> but nothing happens. You sit there for a moment holding your breath, and then 
20, 25 seconds later, lights flicker again. <gasps> they stay on. You slowly let out your breath, and the lights flicker one more time and go out. And you have no power. You think, oh my goodness. Most people, when the power goes out, they wait. Because in our minds we think, it's going to come right back on. <laughs> Welcome to consumer's energy. It's not going to come right back on. Soon, but not right back on. And no power in the house. We're practically helpless. We hope our generator kicks on or we go start a generator. If we don't have a generator, we're like, oh my goodness, the, the basement will flood. My things, don't open the fridge, kids, and don't flush the toilets. Don't use the water. Water still works, but don't use the water. We're going outside, all these things. Because when power's not there, we kind of like don't know what to do. And my friends, we would be lost if God ran out of power. If God's power flickered, we would be lost, but it can't flicker. It is so consistent and so powerful and so encompassing that God's power provides hope. But lastly this morning, look at verse 17. Here is our response. Where the writer says this, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. Last this morning, I'd like to challenge us on this. God's people, God's people must acknowledge him. The verse says this. There's two parts in this verse. There's our part and God's part. Our part in this verse is desire and humility. We must, we must who know God, we must who call upon God, must desire God to love him, to long for him, to look for him. I would submit that one reason that America is still struggling is because God's people don't desire God. That God's people desire everything else but God. They don't ignore God every day, just some days. God is not out of their thoughts, but he's not in all of their thoughts. And here the writer says, there must be a desire. I want us to love God. I want us to long for God. I want us to look to God and look for God. That is the, the part of God's people to have a desire, but also humility to listen to him, to follow him. God's people must acknowledge him. Listen, we don't come to church to get blessed all right, we come to church to worship God. In the process, we are blessed as we worship him. We desire to see him. We desire to know him. We have a desire to love him. How much desire do you have for God? Now, some say, well, pastor, I, I come to church every Christmas, every Easter. What more do you need? Yet more say, well, pastor, I come to church Sunday morning. What more do you need? And others, I come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, what more do you need? My friends, our desire for God cannot be put into a box of church attendance. Our desire for God must come from our beating. That's why the Bible says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. With all my being, I want to love God. That's desire. But I must be humble toward him and listen to him. You ever, ask, ever have someone ask you for advice and then argue with, with you about it? Anybody have that experience? Come on, put them up there. You have that experience? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Doesn't it make you happy? Or do you have this response? Then why'd you ask me? Just do what you want to do. Go ahead, stand in the bucket of water and connect the positive and negative. I don't care. All right? You'll, it'll be an illuminating experience in your life. How do you think God feels? When we ask him for advice and we say, Lord, speak to me, show me, and then ignore him or argue with him with his advice. When he says, hey, trust me through this trial, but Lord, fix the trial, but trust me through it. Lord, I don't like your advice. How do you think he feels? You see, there's a humility here. So the verse says, there's a desire of the humble, desire of the humble those who put themselves down and elevate God's advice, his opinion, his truth, his character. God's people must acknowledge him through desire and through humility. It does us no good to just hear what God says if we don't do what God says. That's our part. And then we see God part, God's part where it says, thou wilt prepare their heart. 
Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. Two things that God does. One, he prepares hearts. The preparation. Did a little study on what that, uh, on what that thought is. And there's a thought that God prepares hearts with his goodness and his grace and his mercy and his compassion. That our hearts are prepared, not through God's judgment, but through his infinite and a boundless love. Aren't you grateful for a loving God? I'm blessed with three wonderful kids. And I try to be a good dad, I fall far short. But as a dad, I try to do things that make the kids laugh and smile. Surprise them with things, gifts. Prepare their hearts, right? Help them enjoy the house and the family and the home that we live in. And I enjoy doing those things. The Bible talks about that. How much more does God do that for his children? The Bible says he caused it to rain in the just and the unjust. We are here in America because of God. He has prepared our heart. How could we not, how could we not respond with desire and humility? How could we not? He's given us his word freely to us. How could we not have desire and humility? And not only that, the Bible says he will cause his ear to hear. So not only does he prepare us with his boundless love and his compassion, his mercies, then he hears us when we call. What a blessing to have a God who will always pick up, who never checks caller ID, says, oh, look at that. Oh, I see Brad Dalton's calling again. Because some, some of us call a lot for the same thing. Oh, boy. You know, it's the, when the advent of, of the cell phone, you get those calls where the people say the same things, and you're like, oh, boy, I don't want to pick up this right now. Or spam calls, yet God never complains. He is only disappointed when we don't call and we don't pray like we ought. You see, God's people must acknowledge him. And so the question is this morning as we close, how bad, how bad will it have to get before God's people put everything else aside and come back to him. You see, I pray for America, but the answer is not in America, it's at God's people. Sharing the truth of God to America. How bad will it have to get before God's people stop putting everything in front of God? How bad will it have to get before God's people will give up their own night for a night in God's house? How bad will it have to be before God's people Stop seeking their own glory and yet seek God's glory. How bad will it have to get before, before God's people will set aside their schedule for God's face and his worship? Perhaps our land is in demise because God's people have stopped desiring and stopped being humble. Because God will prepare hearts and he will hear. This morning, church, I love America, but we love God. And he is the answer to this nation's problems.